You're listening to Psych with Mike. For more episodes or to connect with the show with comments, ideas, or to be a guest, go to www.psychwithmike.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Psych with Mike or like the Facebook page at Psych with Mike. Now, here's Psych with Mike. Welcome into the Psych with Mike Library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan, and I am here, as always, with my good friend and colleague, Mr. Brett Newcomb. I'm, I'm back again. Back again. Yep. Together again, again. So let's just say, I usually say this at the end of the yeah. show, so I'm going to say it at the front end of the show. Yeah. Uh, if people listen to Psych with Mike, if you have things that you would like to comment about, you can get us at psychwithmike.com. If you have any kind of suggestions about shows, things that you would like to hear us talk about, you can suggest things there. Um, and you can go to YouTube and subscribe to Psych with Mike. So you go to YouTube, search Psych with Mike, find the show, and hit subscribe. Even if you don't regularly access the show that way, going there and subscribing to that is really helpful for us. So I just well, want to... for you, because then you don't have to remember to go out and look for it. It'll just come to your mailbox. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, now most people... or. According to our numbers, most people don't access the show through the video through YouTube. Some people do, and you yeah. know that's that's great. Oh, I, I don't care. It. I huh? recommend it. I think they should look because we're both so incredibly good looking. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and the uh, value uh, or the 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 quality of the editing of the show is superior. Yes. <laughs> So uh, I would say that that was good communication. Well, it was communication. Well, maybe it was communication. It was an attempt to communicate. <clears throat> but it's what what we're doing right now is what's called a mediated conversation. Okay. Uh, a mediated conversation. Tell me more. <laughs> mediated conversation involves the use of some technology or equipment or device. Mm -hmm. So they're listening to us or they're watching us but they're not in the room talking to us. You and I are having a direct communication. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at you and I'm saying what I say. You're looking at me and you're saying what you say. That allows me access to your nonverbals and your nonverbals to the degree that I can hear them or read them, improve my accuracy in understanding your communication exponentially. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about better communications, we try to start on a one-to-one -one direct uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't matter if you're talking to your next-door neighbor, to your wife, to your child, to your preacher. If you can get in the room with them and look at them, then each of you has an opportunity to have access to the nonverbals of the other. Mm -hmm. And so then we all have learned and internalized some information or concepts about nonverbal communication. What does this behavior mean? If you cross your leg, what does it mean if you cross your arms? What does it mean if you, if you have a muscle popping out on your jaw? Uh, and there are global interpretations of what that generally means. And you get in trouble when you know those global things and you make that assumption mm -hmm. about somebody. So you need the verbal skills to say, your jaw's popping. Are you upset? And then you have the opportunity to go wide-eyed. What? Me? No, of course not. Why would you say that? You know, and deny the contradiction in your communication. I actually had an experience where I was uh, supervising a student that was in an internship. Yeah. And this person came. And so part of that is that you have to come and talk about your cases. Mm -hmm. And this person came and did a case presentation. And this individual thought that they were being really, really, uh, uh, sanguine and, and top of the class by saying exactly what you're saying. So the, this person's, you know, their jaw was really tense and, and I could tell that they were really angry and, I don't know why, but from what I knew of the case, I didn't really, I wasn't as convinced. And so I had, I asked this person, have you ever explored the possibility that this individual has a facial tick? And this person said, uh, no. And I said, well, I would just 
ask about that before yeah. you draw that conclusion. And this person went back and sure enough, this individual had a facial tick. And so that's one of the things that can happen that can oftentimes misrepresent nonverbal behavior. So nonverbal behavior is great. And all of us take in information through nonverbals, whether we're consciously aware of it or not. I would argue that you and I specifically depend on nonverbals much more than either one of us would be consciously aware of. But you also have to no, couch I think we, that. I think we are and trained to be consciously aware of it. You know, we both studied Ken Cooper and Albert Morabian and their uh, research that says only 7% mm -hmm. of the communication between two individuals in a direct communication is verbal. Yeah. 93% of it is nonverbal. Yeah. The, the challenge there, though, and, and we train clinicians to be therapists, mm -hmm. and we talk about these issues of communication and nonverbals and so on. Um, the phrase I like to use is rolling assumptions. Mm -hmm. I, when mm -hmm. I taught the class that you're describing, I would have my students make a videotape of a volunteer client that, and themselves mm -hmm. for an initial or introductory session. And then they would have to come in and present the case to the class, and we would watch the tape. And I would always start the tape and class sitting around watching the screen, start the tape. They see the client come into the room and sit down. I turn it off. I say, what do you see? Mm -hmm. What do you think? What are you looking at? Why are they here? What's going on in their lives? And they look at me like I was an idiot. Like, well, they haven't said anything yet. I said, they've said a lot. Mm -hmm. you, know, you went out to the waiting room and you got them. How were they sitting? How were they standing? Who were they with? You know, were they reading a magazine? Were they just blankly staring at the wall? You know, what assumptions are you making already, even unconsciously, mm -hmm. about this person? How are they dressed? How do they move? How relaxed are they? How stiff are they? And they're like, well, you can't do that. So you, not only can you, you do. You just mm -hmm. have to learn to recognize that you do. And then you have to learn to check your assumptions and be open to modifying mm -hmm. them. So you make rolling assumptions. I think this is an angry person. Then as you get to know them and know the background of why they present the way they mm -hmm. present, they may be angry, they may not mm -hmm. be, or they may not be angry about what you think they're angry mm -hmm. about. So, so you have to modify your assumptions on, on a fluid and ongoing basis mm -hmm. as you get more and more information. You spend more time with the mm -hmm. client. And so I'll ask you this question, and I think I know the answer, but yeah. do you believe that there is benefit for the therapist to challenge the assumption. So if I think you're an angry person, do you think there is benefit for the clinician to say, I'm feeling or sensing or not even saying that, just saying, I'm wondering if you are angry right now? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely imperative that yeah. they do that, but they have to do it the right way. Yeah. They can't do it accusatively. You're mad. Mm -hmm. They have to do it invitationally. It's my strong desire to hear you accurately and understand you. So I need to share with you that right now I'm getting vibrations that tell me you're angry. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know if you can tell me whether you are or not. Because if you're not, fine. I just need to understand. I just need to know. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, well, I'm not angry. And say, okay, great. Do you mind mm -hmm. if I ask you every time I think that's happening mm -hmm. so that I can learn to understand what your nonverbals are saying, mm -hmm. what you're really communicating? And in my experience... Clients always say, yeah, yeah, you can raise it up, you can ask. And if I ask the right way, if I'm right, mm -hmm. eventually they'll look at me and go, oh, my God, you're right. Mm -hmm. I, 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 but if I'm not right, then I learn something mm -hmm. that's useful information about understanding the client. And my guess is is that you not being right is probably well, fairly I, rare. I because, would certainly like well, to think but, so. But because we're, we're both really good at interpreting nonverbal behavior, so... Uh, but what I would argue is that we may be right in our interpretation of the nonverbal the behavior, may not know it. and the client and not. may they regularly not, say no, and they, they're being or truthful. that the the reason for the manifestation yeah. of the nonverbal behavior is different than what the client thinks. So you could be presenting yeah. an angry facade as a way of not having to be confronted about how you really feel. Well, yeah, I mean, so many iterations of that. For instance, if, if your voice goes cold and flat mm -hmm. every time you mention your mother, 
And I ask you about your relationship with your mother, and you're like, oh, my mother's a saint. She raised us kids. My oh, dad was gone. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and yet there's that flatness that's mm-hmm. not normally present in your voice when you talk about anything or anyone else. There's a message there that I just have to keep nibbling at. Tell me more about your mom. Tell mm-hmm. me more about your history with her. Tell me more about what's going on. And even if they say, well, you know, why are you asking these questions about mm-hmm. my mom? I said, I just, I really need to understand accurately mm-hmm. what is going on with you. And I, I'm thinking something is there, but we haven't found it yet. Is it okay if I keep looking mm-hmm. or do you need me to leave that alone? Why don't you leave that alone? I'm not here for that. Okay, fine. And then it'll come up again. I'm like, mm-hmm. well, you Feels like that just happened again, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and they'll either come back and keep coming back in an appropriate way until it becomes uncovered, yeah. or they'll stop saying, yeah. "You know, I'm not coming here anymore. You don't know what you're doing." Yeah, yeah. Although uh, my guess is is that people would stop coming long before you got to that stage of the therapy. But what I have found is that it's generally about the third time. The third time that you come back to something and say, you know, I'm feeling this same thing again and I'm wanting to make you aware of it is usually about the time. And I don't know if that's the amount of time that the client has spent in connection with us as therapists, or if it's just that, you know, the third time seems to be the charm. But that's been my experience is that about the third time that you say to somebody, hey, this is something that I'm seeing and as you always are pointing out, because you're always looking for the patterns, mm-hmm. this is the thing that I'm seeing. This is the pattern that I'm sensing is developing. It's usually about the third time the client will say, yeah, you know, there might be something more to it. Yeah, I don't, I've never quantified it that way. I don't yeah. know. You could be absolutely right, or that could be your experience. But for me, it's more of a fluid, in-the-moment mm-hmm. presence. Just part of being genuine is being able to say, yeah, you just twitched Mm -hmm. you just had an expression go across your eyes it looks to me like your eyes went vacant and blank Mm -hmm. did you go away somewhere Mm -hmm. they're like no i'm right here i'm looking at you i'm okay okay fine if i think that happens again can i can i mention yeah sure you can mention so then you do it another time or two and then you say it seems like whenever we talk about money you go there or Mm -hmm. whenever we talk about sex you go Mm -hmm. there whenever we talk about alcohol you go there Mm -hmm. uh do you see the connection? Am I off base? Am I misunderstanding? Is that not a pattern? And they're like, no, it's not a pattern. Okay, great. Then tell me more. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, know, you don't ever say, I'm right. I'm the, th- I'm the therapist. I know shit. Oh, yeah, wait a minute. Gotta, yeah. What, you, you don't You do say that. you don't do that? No, 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 no. <laughs> because there may be people who are listening to this that say, Mike does that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> there might there might actually be people like that, yeah. If I if I'm hearing you correctly. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But okay, so uh let's accept as a given that you and I are even though our spouses and our family families may reject this premise, but let's accept for the premise of this argument that you and I are fairly adept at communication. Yes. Okay. Let, let's let's, let's hope accept that, that that's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and my, and you my know, wife might not agree with I, you. I, and my wife would vehemently not agree with that statement. But if you really pressed her, she would say, "Okay, you, you've built this career and you've done this for a long enough period of time that I assume you must have some skill." My wife says, "I understand there are times when you turn it off, when you need to turn it off." Yeah, and, and it's usually with her. It's usually with her. Well, that's my that's my safe place. I don't have to. And we have, it's a joke. Well, but, I'll say, you know, yeah. what, if you want me to listen like that, put money on the table. Yeah, and she's like, ah, "I put dinner on the table." I'm like, "Yes, you did," and I and I should pay attention. And I, but so we have to work mm-hmm. in our relationship on how to cue that I need you to be present for this conversation and that's frightening yeah to to somebody with my background from the family that i come from when somebody says i need to talk to you it means i'm in trouble right and so i'm expecting to be in trouble well my wife says that that doesn't mean i'm in trouble i've had to learn that you know that means she has something she really wants me to pay attention to there are so many different 
layers of that. You had said, oh, because when I go home with her, that's my safe space. Yeah. But then there's also the whole reason why we select our significant other in the first place, which usually has to do with unresolved scripted material from our family of origins. I mean, so there's a whole psychology. At, at least in our first marriages. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so you would say that the second time around, maybe that's... <coughs> maybe there's a difference. I've only done it once, yeah, so I only, know, I only know about the first time. Should you be given an opportunity to but, do it again? Uh, yeah. Oh, please, <laughs> knock on wood. Yeah. I hope that that never happens. But... Uh, you know, so, so yeah, there's, there's a whole different dynamic that goes on in our family as of origin than we, when we're in, doing therapy. And so I would, I would argue that that's, that even though our families don't maybe think that we're the best master communicators in the world, probably most of our clients have experienced us in that way, or they wouldn't come back for weeks, months, years. Yeah, but then you get back into the clinical question about the role of the therapist. Yeah. You know, do you need the safety of being the person in charge? Do you need the uh, nonverbal identifiers of the desk and the big chair? You know, does that imbue you with some status that puts you above the client? Going back to the Ed Larian thing about superiority. You know, I, 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 yeah, they teach us that in grad school. Yeah. And I don't know how much of that I buy. I buy a lot of it. I really? Know. Because I just don't, I mean. You don't see yourself that way. I, not only do I not see myself that way, but obviously psychotherapy is not cheap. And I just do not buy. And, and you and I have both had clients that we've seen for years and maybe even decades. I just don't buy that we would have been able to build careers pay our mortgages, feed our children on a on on that kind of a sham that people would have come back and that we would have been as successful as we were because people were buying into the lie of you you've got this air of superiority or air of uh uh you know significance about you that I I just don't buy that. And and maybe you do. I I don't I I don't buy that. I and I could be wrong. So I'm thinking two or three things. Yeah. One, one thing that I'm thinking is you have a limited perspective. Yeah, uh, well, that's true. In 30 years of training other people to be clinicians and working in various offices with clinicians, I find there are therapists that I think personally are idiots. Well, no, and obviously, and yet they yes, are successful. That's, yes, that's, they reach a niche market. Yeah. And those clients, and maybe they specialize in a topic or an agenda or a focal point where those clients uh, come to okay. them. I see what you're saying. So if you're buying into, if you've got the John Wayne mentality yeah. of I, I'm the big and in charge, and then you will attract to you a clientele. That needs that, that kind of therapy. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Then the other thing I was thinking is you may not have an accurate perception of how aggressively or domineeringly you come across uh, as Obviously, a I, I do not. Because I've been told that multiple, multiple times, my you know response to that is, I live with a <laughs> five foot two my response blonde is, uh, that uh. weighs ninety eight pounds, <laughs> who is not intimidated by me one bit, and so it's difficult for me to see myself in that way. But clearly, there have been some enough people, people who have, have gotten some people me have that seen you that way yes. in the past. I, I understand yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. And and certainly no that one's would... ever seen me that way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> and obviously that's not my intent, or not obviously, but one that is hope. not yeah. my my intent. Yeah. But but yes, I've gotten enough feedback uh, that uh, I I understand intellectually that. Well, that but what is... what would be fascinating is even if you've gotten that feedback, most of your clients stay with you long enough yes. for that not to be an issue. Yeah. For whatever the issues are in their lives, to be allowed to surface and get addressed so you know and that's and that's the one thing that you've always consistently given me as feedback is that regardless of how brisk or whatever intellectualized you might be, that yeah. i might present that if people get to know me that all falls away and there is a genuineness and a sincereness that people come and to and see. A caring there's a compassion 
I, I see that. I've seen that. I've talked to people that have seen that. But I also have seen yeah. that edginess that some people find off-putting. Yeah. And you have to you have to have opportunities to get beyond that. Yeah. If if they're going to stay with you, and and obviously most of them have. So let's go to our break, and when yeah. we come back, I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. Hey, Brett. Yes. What's your favorite thing about Side with Mike? The opportunity to engage in mental gymnastics with you. Wow, that is really powerful. So. <laughs> It's fun. Do you think that that's uh, beneficial for other people? I have no clue. I would hope so, but I have no clue. So it's people should should write us and let us know. Yeah, that'd be nice. That would be great. Especially if they agree with me. As always, if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. Okay, we're back. And so I had started uh, some time ago with this idea, this premise that you and I are good communicators. So let's assume that that's true for the sake of this argument. All right. Then as expert communicators, what do you believe would be the number one thing that you would encourage other people to do to be better communicators themselves? Attending. Okay. So uh, tell me more. If I want to communicate with you, especially in a relationship, but if I want to attend, uh, to communicate with you, I have to attend to you. Mm -hmm. I have to listen to what you have to say. Mm -hmm. Most people, when they are just casually trying to communicate, aren't communicating. They're turn-taking. Mm -hmm. So while you're talking, I listen. I, I can listen about seven times faster than you can speak. If you talk as fast as you can possibly talk, mm -hmm. I can absorb and think and re respond in my head about seven times faster than that. So I listen just long enough to get the gist of where you're going. And especially with you, you build clocks. You don't ever tell me what time it is. So when I recognize that you're building a clock, then I go inside and prepare a package response and I wait for an opportunity to deliver it. And, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and so then I insert that. And while I'm delivering it, you're already working on your next response to me. So we do turn taking, mm -hmm. we're not communicating. Mm -hmm. So to attend to you, means I need to pay attention and mm -hmm. listen to what it is you're trying to say, but also how you're coming across. But the depth of our relationship would... Well, but, but in counseling, you teach people that skill. I say, you know, it, this couple that's come in, this family that's come in, and there are all these family dynamics of tension and anger and hurt and woundedness. And I say, we've got to learn to communicate better. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we're going to do is an is a experiment. When she says something... You can't respond until you've summarized mm -hmm. what you heard. Literally, I heard you say this. You never get up in the morning and fix breakfast for the kids. And as I heard it, you felt angry, mm -hmm. frustrated, whatever. I have to describe it. And then I have to say, did I hear you accurately? Mm -hmm. And you say, no, you didn't hear me at all. So then the therapist says, okay, John. Say it again. Mm -hmm. What did you hear her say? What did you feel coming off of? And you just keep doing that until finally she says, yes, you heard me. So then I can respond. And mm -hmm. I can say, well, whatever I want to say. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a woman's job to get up and fix breakfast for you. Fine. And then she has to, before has to she gets yeah. defensive, come back at me and say, this is what you said. And as you said it, this is what I was picking up. Mm-hmm. Did I get that right? Yeah. And so you teach people that skill. Right. You and I. And, and we were taught that in graduate school yeah. as the tennis ball exercise. So you have a yeah. tennis ball. People, and it doesn't, it could be a pen. Yeah, it could it be, you know, yeah. a coffee cup. It doesn't matter what the object is. Right. But whoever's holding the object gets to speak. And the other person, then you pass the object to the other person. The other person has to relate back to the originator the context of their message before they can react. Yeah. Both the, the words they heard them say and that can and be the feelings yeah. that were communicated. That can be super powerful. Another exercise that we did for teaching clinicians about this exact skill was to have them stand within the personal space bubble within mm. six or seven inches of each other and just look into each other's eyes for two minutes. Man, I remember when we Without used to do that in grad school. Without distracting with a joke or oh. a smile or a flinch yeah. or a sneeze. And then at the end of that time, I would say to you, this is what I have learned or heard from you mm -hmm. in these two minutes. And you would say to me, well, that's interesting. This is what I heard from you. 
And then you have a dialogue about how accurately. And I remember doing that in, yeah. in grad school and uh, when it was when it's originally proposed, you think this is ridiculous, and and usually because none of us are prepared for the intimacy that is passed between two people when you're just sitting looking at each other for two minutes and no speaking so, no so words. Clinicians need to be skilled at that. Yeah, exactly. I had a man come to my house yesterday. Knocked on the door, representing the water company. Mm -hmm. My neighborhood's having some work done. And he's going to every house and he's explaining whatever about the work that's being done. And uh, I just I felt there was so much more going on with this guy than the mm -hmm. piece of information that mm -hmm. he was asking me. And so I asked him a question and he teared up, started crying. His, mm -hmm. his son had just died a week ago. Damn. And I said, "Would you? Would, is is it appropriate that I ask? You know, what what happened to your son?" And then he started explaining what happened to his son. His son was thirty years old, and he died unexpectedly. And so then he spent forty five minutes in my house talking to me about his son, mm. just because I asked the question mm -hmm. that said, "I see something more than the pro forma reason that mm -hmm. you're here in my house." Mm -hmm. And I I have had people object to that. Oh I, yeah, I, sure. Know, to, uh, I don't want to come talk. To, I, I used to have students in my high school where I taught that would refuse to walk past my door uh, because they said, you see too much. Yeah. You know, so if something's going on with them, I'd say, what's going on with you? And they, My sister-in-law's first husband was one of those people. Yeah, yeah, I remember. <laughs> but, uh, it, it, you know, so while you are talking about this idea that you and I, especially in the podcast, may have this dynamic where we're constantly cr structuring, crafting our next response to each other. And that may be the... No, that's the way most people talk. I was going to say, that may be the yeah. standard way that most people talk to each other. The, the depth of our relationship would portend that there's had to have been times in the past where we have actually sat and listened to each other and actually attended in an active kind of way. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, in any enduring relationship, there are those yeah. cycles or waves of that. But I think there are also iterations where it's blah, blah, ginger. It's mm -hmm. just noise that you make. And depending on the context of the noise, right. you're... Well, and it, it can be okay. There can yeah. be times where that's okay. If you're at a party then that kind of superficial interaction yeah. is perfectly okay. Where'd you As buy those shoes? Yeah, nobody yeah. wants you to right. go deeper doesn't than matter. that. doesn't matter, yeah. But if you're actually sitting with your spouse at the kitchen table and your spouse is in emotional pain, then that kind of interaction is not the best way to communicate. No. So I would tell clients all the time that back when we had a football team in St. Louis and I used to be really, really super into sports and I would spend entire days watching sports on TV, my kids would come into the room and want to you talk to me. You they have to be quiet. Wait till halftime. Wait till, I, yeah. Hopefully I didn't, but oh, yes, did. I'm sure there were times when I did do that. But if there were times I, you did that to me. If you invite I, me over to watch a ball game, if I wanted to say something, you'd be like, well, shut up, ball you, game's on. You weren't, you weren't yeah. into sports. Uh, yeah. But if, if I am sitting there, and, and I don't care how you rearrange the words, I'm whacking my mic. Uh, but So I would say they would come into the room. I could hear them if they said, hey, Dad, can I talk to you? But I couldn't listen to them until I turned off the TV. Yeah. And I don't care, you know, because some people would say, oh, no, I would listen to them, but I couldn't hear them. I don't care how you conceptually understand what I'm saying, but there has, there's more to what you're talking about, the attentive listening, yeah. than just being able to hear air molecules being vibrated. So as a clinician, you're trained attention and reflective listening are critical skills. Mm -hmm. Reflective listening is I listen and then I reflect back to you what I heard verbally and non-verbally, that, that example or experiment that we just talked about. Those are skills, if I'm going to be a successful, if I'm going to be helpful 
as a clinician. I have to have those skills. Mm -hmm. So that's three that we're talking about. Reading nonverbals, uh, paying attention, doing reflective listening. I think those are fundamental, and it's enough to get started. Mm -hmm. You know, you can build a relationship, you can pursue a pattern, you can do whatever, if you can do those three things. And so for me, if yeah. I were going to tell somebody the number one thing that I would like for them to do to be able to communicate better is for people to be able to own their own feelings. So you can't tell the cop when he shows up at the door that the reason you hit her with the frying pan was because she made you mad. <laughs> she didn't make you nothing. Yeah. You made yourself yeah. mad whether you want to take responsibility for it or not. And if people can, so much of our communication is about projecting yeah. our emotional states onto somebody onto else. Other people. Hey, yeah. boy, you got a bad grade. Well, now I'm mad. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? Okay. Now, is that the appropriate response for that interaction for what has transpired? And so for people to be able to recognize the ownership of their own emotional states gives you the ability, it liberates you to be able to have actual conversations that can be attentive and can be interactive. But as long as all we're doing is projecting our emotional states onto other people to try and justify them, there's no and, communication. And many of us grew up in homes where we were taught the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. We were taught, get that look off your face. Or Who I'll do you slap think you're talking you. to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we learn to mask our feelings and our thoughts in order to survive. Mm -hmm. So then as you get older and live in a freer environment, you need to be aware that that may be a pattern of communication mm -hmm. that still impacts your relationships, whether it's at work or at home or with neighbors up and down the block. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many times have you been in therapy with somebody and the answer to a question was, well, he or she made me yeah. mad, glad, sad, or scared. Right? Yeah. And it's like, how did that person do that? How did they make you that way? Well, they didn't put the lid on the toothpaste. So they didn't put the lid on the toothpaste. That made you mad? How did that make you mad? The emotion. Because I told them 5,000 times. Exactly. The yeah. So because they didn't listen to the message that you were sending, yeah. you're now upset. Okay, well, now we're having a real communication. But... As long as it's just perfunctory, I'm going to project my emotional states on so everybody there, else. There's that four there's part no communication. assertive communication mm -hmm. model. When you, and I describe your behavior, and, th and that's the hardest part of it. When you crunch ice with your teeth, with your lips open when we're having mm -hmm. lunch, I feel, what do I feel? I feel frustrated, I feel irritated, I feel like I want to slap you in the face. What, what do I feel? Mm -hmm. Because... Well, what is it in my life that makes mm -hmm. me have that reaction when you crunch ice? What I need is mm -hmm. don't crunch ice. Mm -hmm. So people have to learn to identify those four components mm -hmm. to make a communication that's going to facilitate the relationship yeah. or the situation. And, and the only modifier that I would put on that, because yeah. I've done that my yeah. entire career. The only modifier that I put on that when I do that is that the I feel uh -huh. has to be glad, mad, sad, or scared because those are the four affective, A-F-F-E-C-T, yeah. which means emotion. Those are the four emotional states. So if I feel disrespected, well, you can't feel disrespected because that's not a feeling. And so what I'm really trying to stress in people is identify what is that emotional state and can you take responsibility for that not project it onto the other person as a way of justifying it own your own emotion i don't make the same distinction that you mm -hmm. do about that but i do sometimes add a fifth step which mm -hmm. is when you say what i need is for you not to do that the fifth step is and if I, if you are not willing or able to do that, what I will do is, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you never threaten, mm -hmm. you never suggest something that you won't follow through on. But if you say, I need you to not drink anymore tonight at the party, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm getting concerned 
or I'm getting angry, I'm getting hurt, I'm getting whatever I'm getting. Uh, so I need you to stop drinking. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, I'm going to call a cab and go home. And when you start this process, yeah. that fifth step may be nonverbal. Right. It may just be something that the person does for themselves because they need to start to think in terms of their only power is, well, then I'm going to do X. That's their only authority. Yeah. And they need to be aware of what is it that you could or would be willing to do if this person doesn't comply. And and are we talking about an immediate moment situation? Mm-hmm. Or are we talking about a more global, you know, I'm going to divorce you. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a more complex set of problems. Right. But I can call a cab and go home. Right. Or I can leave right now and go home. Exactly. Uh, and take the car. And then you figure out how to get home. Exactly. Uh, so, But you have to facilitate teaching people that don't have those communication skills how to have them. Mm-hmm. And then you encourage them to use them. But if they don't learn them, they can't use them. Exactly. And if they do learn them, they still may not use them. Well, then there's a deeper problem. Not without real intentional practice yeah. and if they're not willing to and, do and the empathy. real intentional practice yeah. then that really wasn't what they wanted to do to begin with so exactly. then they, like you just said so then there's up. some other yeah. problem right. yeah. okay hopefully that was good for everybody i was certainly good for me that was a good conversation mr brett it was good for me was it good for you? <laughs> it was good for me uh, so the music that appears in Psych with Mike is written and performed by Mr. Benjamin DeClue. And as always, if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. <laughs>